Father God, I pray that you will that you will come and just open up our hearts, prepare our hearts, including my own, for the message today. Father God, I just pray that you will that you will help us to come to our senses and help us to realize how desperate we are for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, uh, I mean, I'm calling this the prodigal's brother among the pigs. And uh, we don't always think of the prodigal's brother among the pigs, but that's what I'm hoping to talk about. But let me ask a question. Have you ever been angry? Yeah. And by angry, I mean, have you ever been smoking mad? The prodigal son's brother was smoking mad. And from everyone's point of view, he had good reason to be angry. Everyone that is, but dad. The heir of a wealthy landowner, the obedient son, lived his life careful to obey the rules, or at least in public, always concerned to keep in dad's good graces, and he's always concerned about appearances. And yet in spite of the son's good grades, his hard work in the family business, and his good standing in the community, his dad always seemed sad around him. His dad reminded him over and over how much he loved his son, how much he loved both of his sons. And nothing about his dad ever contradicted that. He was good. Really good. Too good, he thought. Dad's expectations seemed high. Really high. But Dad was never afraid to help when the work got hard. It actually bothered both of the sons how much everyone, including the hired hands, really loved their dad. But no one could possibly be that good, could they? No one but their dad? So one son hoofed it out of town, while the other son simply worked harder. He took on important posts at the church, he even ran for city council, he paid his tithe, he had a pantry full of Loma Linda foods. <laughs> He had a bookshelf that had nothing but the red books. But Dad still seemed sad. He'd say, why don't you come into the house, son? Let's, let's have some coffee and chat. I know I'm going to hear about that today. Are you saying the father drank coffee? <laughs> It was postal, I'm sure. <laughs> Maybe Pero. <laughs> the father would say, tell me, son. Tell me about your dreams for the future. I want to help you. You're right, the son thought. He had work to get done. Plus, on most nights, he and his friends planned to eat out. Maybe down a few beers. But what about later, Dad would ask? Well, on those nights, he had the latest season of the latest series on the latest streaming service to keep up with. It takes a lot to keep up with all those series. Dad often said, come on into the house, son. I, I pulled a pie out of the oven, and I've got some ice cream to go with it. Seriously, Dad? How do you expect me to do that Plus, do everything else you want me to get done. Son, let the hired hands finish up. The son snorted. Well, that's all I think I am sometimes. A hired hand. Except they get paid. Too well, I might add. No, Dad would plead. No, don't you know who you are? You're no mere servant. You are my son. 
You're my heir. And all that I have is yours. The son got used to these kinds of conversations and he always doubted his dad's sincerity. Dad's just sad, he thought, because his deadbeat brother had shamed him by leaving town with a bundle of cash. And every day, Dad was out there keeping a hopeful eye on the horizon, and that really ticked him off. And then one day, the unspeakable happened. His deadbeat brother came home. Filthy, skin and bones, and Dad, the daughtery fool, responded exactly as the obedient son knew he would with open arms. If it had been up to the obedient son, a band of hired hands would have turned that boy around and made him go back to wherever it was he came from. Maybe scuff him up a little. This house will be mine, he thought. And ain't no way he'll be welcome in my house. Not without some groveling. Let him work back that money he took. I know you know this story. It's Jesus' most surgically precise parable. The parable of the prodigal son. And it's hard not to feel for the obedient brother. You see, in the biblical world of the Gospels, the most egregious sin anyone could ever commit was this. To intentionally dishonor one's father or mother. In our world, we just call that being a teenager. <laughs> In Jesus' story, the prodigal dishonored his family, his town, his church, even his nation in the vilest of ways, but mostly he dishonored dad. He not only stated publicly how he wished his dad were dead, but he actually set out to humiliate him further by seeking his inheritance in advance. Jesus put it this way. He said, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. I want you to notice something similar about the two brothers. Neither truly believes the father loves him. And neither truly loves the father. Both knew dad was rich. The obedient son is working so hard to prove his love for the dad, even if he's got to fake it. The prodigal, on the other hand, is sick and tired of going through the motions of being a good son in hopes of snatching up some sort of promise, rewards in the end, you know, like eternal life, heaven, a mid-sized mansion. Both sons resemble the vast majority of churchgoers. And this, they want the dad's stuff without all the rigmarole that comes with living under dad's roof. Both believe a terrible lie that as long as dad's around, there's no freedom. So one son kills the dad in his mind and the other simply hopes for it. And then, to the obedient son's horror, dad does something utterly buffoonish, as he so often does. He welcomes the deadbeat home. Why? Why, the obedient son wonders, would his dad even have given his brother anything? Be real, his brother had essentially declared, I can't wait for you to die. As far as my life goes, you are dead. So go on, grab me my payout. We know the prodigal story as well as any story in the Gospels or even in the Bible. The punk of a son takes the largesse of his father and then travels to another country, a distant country, a remote place so out of the way, few would dare follow him. I like to think he went to North Dakota. <laughs> he traveled so far away because of the shame he would have encountered in his own country and that would have followed him at every turn 
And then, like the inevitable weather cycles of Nebraska, a famine swept the country. I mean, it's North Dakota. And this was a bad one. Kind of like the summer of 2022. Here the prodigal receives a hard lesson. Nothing reveals one's true relationships like hardships, a failure, or a famine. How many of you have actually experienced that before? Maybe shame or a scandal or failure. Only, the, only to learn how so many of your friendships have a brief shelf life. Have you ever experienced a great hardship in your life only to discover that your so-called friends weren't friends at all? Just circling vultures with an agenda. No doubt the same famine swept through his dad's country too, but there one would have community. There he would have had camaraderie and fellowship, help even if undeserved. There, he would have found family. And here's where Jesus changes the scene dramatically. The camera comes up on a pen of pigs. There, the prodigal works the only job he can find, a pig keeper. And Jesus puts it this way. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. It's a pathetic sight. He probably smells worse than the pigs because unlike pigs, people have sweat glands. He's starving. He's lustfully looking at the husks and pig slop left over from his boss's table. Now, Jesus is such a master storyteller here. He places the prodigal not only in financial poverty, but also in spiritual poverty. You see, to care for pigs literally would have disqualified him from even a handout from any devout folks. I didn't know that. Pigs are unclean by Jewish law. To even toss him a coin would not only defame and sully the giver, it would actually defame and sully the giver's family. Best to leave him to wallow in his filth. What's worse, the only people allowed to tend pigs are slaves. The once proud son, desperate for freedom, he thought his dad kept away from him, had exchanged the true freedom of a loving family for slavery to a new master. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Of course not. I mean, I can hear the insults of people passing by. He got what he deserved, and he deserved what he got. They'll probably just take that money and spend it on drugs or booze. And then the story takes a dramatic turn. A moment as epic as Saul's conversion to Paul on the Damascus Road. As long-lasting as that of the thief on the cross. There are no fireworks here. No light bulbs come on on top of his head. And none but God himself could see the immensity of the moment. Jesus puts it this way. But then he came to his senses, he said. How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will rise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Now, did you catch the moment? Maybe some recognize this moment. It's the single most powerful moment 
in one's life. It is called belief. It's called faith. For the first time, the prodigal son believes his dad is just what he says he is. And he comes to his senses. For the first time, he believes in who he is. Now, stand back and watch the transformation take place. It may take some time, but it's going to happen. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, I love this scene. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I know the son's conversion and his faith. His belief is authentic because of this. And this is important. I believe it's authentic because one, he truly believes who God is in this moment. He truly believes that his father is his father. Second, he feels the ache he need to repent. Amen. And with faith comes the, that sense, that conviction to repent. And three, he feels the uncontrollable per, a pull to return to his dad. And dad's delighted. Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hands and shoes on his feet. And, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. The prodigal hasn't even had a chance to shower. Have you noticed that? He hasn't even had a chance to clean himself off. And he's already got a robe and a ring. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. Yeah. And they began to celebrate. Yeah. Okay, we love this story. And no matter how many times I hear it, it speaks to me. And I worried about it. I kept saying, Lord, please give me another story. We've heard this story and it just kept coming back. You need to talk about this story. But the key question is this. At what point in this story did the prodigal son again become the dad's son? I want to argue he never stopped Amen. being the son. Amen. He was always his father's son. Amen. He never stopped in the heart and mind of the father. This was his son. He is and always will be his son. He loves him, forgives him, and welcomes him, not as a stranger, not as a hired hand, but as his son. Amen. Dad never changes. Amen. Amen. What has changed? The son, for the first time, believes. Amen. Now, do you remember that moment? That moment when you came to your senses? Maybe it was a single dramatic moment. Or maybe like me, it wasn't a dramatic moment, but rather it was a realization over a season. Or, have you come to your senses yet? Because I believe that there are some here, I'm going to even say, I bet there are many here who have yet to feel that, to know what it is to truly believe that God is who he says he is. There are some here who actually don't yet believe that you are who God says you are. That you are a son of God, a daughter of God. Some here have yet to have that moment when they realize that they have sinned, not only against heaven, but against the dad who adores them. And if that's you, I, can I tell you something? You are not nobody. You are the son of a king. You are the daughter of a king. And that's not nobody. Not only that, you have a rich dad who adores you. You never stop being his child. 
And God never withholds His love for you like a carrot on a stick, waiting for you to chase it and catch it. The dad's love, his mercy and forgiveness awaited the prodigal the whole time, and it waits for us before we ever left, before we ever got back. My friend, you are forgiven. You are loved. Most professed Christians don't actually believe that. Most don't realize how the pigsty of this world, of our culture, of our daily schedule is not all there is. Most of the world is content to live as a slave to a pig owner. When we are children of a great and loving king. Come to our senses, friends. But let's go deeper. In the story of the prodigal, when did the dad truly become his dad? That is, when did the prodigal realize his dad was indeed a loving dad? Well, the dad never changed, but the son did not truly grasp who he truly was until he came to his senses. In that moment, the father became to him not merely a dad, he became his dad. Mm -hmm. Before this moment, his dad was a bothersome rule maker, a lawgiver and a law enforcer, a legalistic impediment to fun and freedom. Freedom, he believed dad purposely withheld from him. In that moment, and hear me out on this, I'm going to go into some theology here. In that moment of belief, the son literally became a new sort of creature. Mm -hmm. From that moment on, he became a new creation. Mm -hmm. In that moment of coming to his senses, his identity as a son of God became what scripture calls being in Christ. Amen. Second Corinthians 5.17, the, the verse that is our theme verse for this church it says this, if anyone is in Christ, in other words, if anyone believes, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Amen. In that moment of coming to his senses, he felt free, free to go home again, free to confess his sin, free to eat well again, free to have community again, free to accept Whatever role the Father might have for him, even if that meant being a servant. But wait, some will say, and I can hear it already, the son's still wallowing in pig slop in this moment. The old hasn't passed away, the prodigal still is a mess. Yep. The foul smell of pig poop and mud still covered the son's body. But he is, at that moment, a new creation. Yes. Now just stand back and watch the transformation take place. But some will say he ought to clean himself up before going home, put on some new clothes, fix up his hair, maybe earn some of the money back, and then perhaps he will one day become a new creation. No. He has stepped into the light of faith he is already a new creation. Now stand back and watch the transformation. It might be slow, but it's beginning to happen already. He was not what he will yet be, but stand back and watch. He's like Neo in the Matrix. I love that. <laughs> Choosing the red pill. He is there among the Filthy pigs, and yet true freedom already is beginning to come into his heart. And he's beginning to realize where true freedom is. It's in his father's house. Jesus never tells us about the long journey home. About the hardships he experiences and how slow the road seemed at times. He never tells us how long it takes to get home. But Jesus does tell us how dad ran to welcome him he tells us how he was prepared to carry his son the rest of the way if he had to. And it's beautiful. We call this story the parable of the prodigal son. But actually, 
The prodigal is not even the primary point of the story. Because if he were, his story would be the story's climax. But it's not. And so we, ret we return to the obedient son. The good son. One who was clean. Who smells good. Who went to church this morning. Who's respected by the community. He's got a comfy bed back in dad's house. Jesus tells it this way. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. No doubt it was Southern Gospel. <laughs> <laughs> he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother's come. And your father's killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. Father, listen to the obedient son. Look, these many years I've served you. And I never disobeyed your command. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, he doesn't even want to say brother. <laughs> when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. Amen. It was fitting. To celebrate and be glad. For this is your brother. And he was dead. And he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. So here we are where we started. The obedient son is smoking mad. Most of us would share that anger if we, like him, had watched firsthand how his dad suffered. If we had witnessed the shame everyone experienced because of his selfish brother. But the obedient son has not yet come to his senses. He doesn't know it, but he's actually wallowing in pig slop. It's a pig slop he can't smell or see. His dad can see it, probably can smell it. Notice the obedient son's primary complaint. Look, these many years I've served you. I got up this morning, I went to church, even though it's going to be hot today. <laughs> and I never disobeyed your command. I wasn't even allowed to be in sports because of Sabbath. Got a lot of reasons to be really mad, Dad. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. No different from the prodigal, the obedient son viewed his dad as a barrier to freedom. And like his brother, the obedient son has imagined his dad as a tyrant to be placated. But the father answers, and he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. Now, I've always read that to mean, son, be patient. When I'm dead, you get everything. <laughs> then you can have a feast with your friends. But that is not the gospel that Jesus is teaching here. The dad is actually saying something I never realized. He's saying, everything that's mine is yours. It has always been yours. And you have always been free to ask me you've always been free to ask me for a calf for your friends you don't have because you have never asked oh. it's as if the father is saying there are two things you have yet to believe son one is that you're my son and two that I'm your dad your dad and I adore you <laughs> I welcomed your brother home and into the house just as I'm ready to do for you right now. Preach. Please come in. Amen. Please come in. Amen. That's right. The Apostle John, 
He wrote it this way, see what kind of love, and I wrote, the dad has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. Amen. Does the obedient son ever come to his senses? Does he ever truly grasp who he really is? Does he ever come into the house? Does he ever step out of his own personal pigsty? Jesus never tells us. And that's because you haven't decided yet. And you know who I'm talking to. You've tried to please everyone and you're tired. You're so tired. And yet you have at your fingertips the bottomless love and riches and freedom of the dad's house. Amen. Your dad's house. Come in. Come inside. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I want to point out a few people today. I want to point out Pastor Kathy here. Can you stand up, Kathy? And Dana, I know Dana's here. Where are you, Dana? She's right here. Pastor Frank, where are you, Pastor Frank? Right over here. Tell you what, if you are feeling like, I, I need Christ today, and you need someone to pray over you today, come to see, you see myself. See Kathy or Frank or Dana. We'd love to pray over you. We would love that. We have some prayer warriors here today too. How many prayer warriors stand up right now? Stand up. Be brave. Stand up. Look around. If you see somebody here, say, I want you to find that person and say, I, I need the Father. I want to come into the house. Maybe you've never come to your senses. Maybe you did once, but you've forgotten. Maybe you left. Pray with me, Father God. Thank you for being our Father. Thank you for always being our Father. Thank you for never changing. Father, help us to come to ourselves, to come to the realization, to come to faith, where we believe with the help of the Holy Spirit and the grace that you are our Father and that we are your children. Mm -hmm. Lord, some here have never experienced that, but they want to today. They feel the calling. They feel the Holy Spirit tugging on their, tugging on their hearts. And if that is you, I want to ask you to raise your hand right now. If that is you, raise your hand right now. I want to ask our pastors to look and see if anyone, raise your hand right now if that person is you, I, I want to come to my senses now, Lord, I'm feeling that I want to be, be free, I want to come back into the Father's house. There are some who have forgotten and feeling like I used to be there, but somehow I've turned back. Raise your hand if that's you, raise your hand, raise your hand, and if that's you, we would like to pray for you too. And some here, everyone thinks you've got it together. Some here feel like there's no way that person doesn't have it together. They're the obedient son or daughter. But you're thinking, I, I need to come into the house and I'm afraid. If that's you, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Say, Lord, I want to come into the house. And now I want to ask something because I believe that there is power in faith. And you will have the courage to take an action. Just as Jesus said to Peter, come on out of the boat, he still had to step out. Amen. I'm going to ask those people to step out of the boat. And I'm going to ask you to stand up now. To stand up. If you would raise your hand at any of those points, stand up now. Don't leave this day without coming for prayer. And I want you to look around You can have your eyes open. Everyone else's eyes are closed. Find someone that you feel called right now to pray for you. They will pray for you. Just come and say, I need prayer. I want to come back in. I invite everyone to stand with me now. Stand with me.
And let's just pray, Lord. No matter where we are in our walk, we trust that we are coming back to you. Some of us have been on the path for a long time. Lord, keep us on the path to the Father's house. Knowing that the Father is right there with us all along. That he will come, he will pick us up if he has to. Some of us never have. But Father, I pray that there will be revival in this church. May we no longer play at church. The time has come in the world where we, we must stop playing at church. Because we must come to you now. So Lord, we come to you as that son in the pig slot. We come to you as that thief on the cross. We come to you like Paul in the Damascus road. We step out of the boat like Peter. We say, Lord, I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I'm going to give my life and heart to you. Make me a disciple, please. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, friends. Hallelujah.